Shalom, shalom, shalom. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero with the ways of Israel, Los Caminos de Israel. And the reason that I'm doing this video in particular is to uh, make it very clear with so much of a, a desire that the Jewish people have for the coming of Mashiach and especially uh, in Israel where there is a fervor wishing and desiring with all their hearts and minds that Mashiach would make its appearance. Just need to remind every single um, observant Jew that our history is full of pseudo Mashiachs. And we have great leaders in the Jewish community that look at the, any potential Mashiach and they inspect them very, very closely because our history of having received and having the, the deal with false messiahs or could have been, should have been, would have been, is has been so, so marred in our history that we are still uh, recovering from the last one. And I won't go into who the last one is, but the fact is the whole concept of Mashiach is something that is within our Torah, both the written and oral law. And there's so many different points of view. Some would even argue that he has already come. And I won't say which ones because it really everyone who basically thinks their guy is it, he's come already. He just has to come for a second time. You know, maybe he's, he died and he has to be brought back from the dead. That's one position. And the other position is, oh, yes, he is. He's the one. So what is going on with this whole thing of of uh, Rabbi uh, Shlomo Yehuda Haberi that they've given him the title of Yanuka? Uh, Yanuka Rav Shlomo Yehuda you'll find a lot of videos and he has an incredible talent for music and you see him a very young man about 33 years of age approximately and both uh, those who are concerned that he is a false messiah not the messiah obviously that's mainly coming from the christian camp uh, not the jewish camp uh, are, are completely um, all stirred up about this guy because they see the orthodox world uh, embracing him as something more than just a, a a rabbi figure, but a man that even has done some miracles according to reports. Now, we need to get ourselves back and well-established on Torah and Halakha to make it very clear, because if not, we can go after wrong Messiah figures or people that basically are very pious in their nature and are very, very learned like this man who's very, very learned in Torah, in all aspects of Torah. And this is something that draws a lot of the other religious uh, leaders to him because of his depth and knowledge, not only of the written Torah, of the oral Torah, of the esoteric Torah, and different aspects that has brought people to, to come and to come close to him. He is coming from a Hasidic background. He was born and raised in Spain, um, is my understanding. And because he's been accredited for performing miracles and is recognized as a highly esteemed rabbi, a Rebbe, who has a lot of students that follow him, uh, he is a gentleman that basically has stirred up the world, has stirred up at least the Israeli world, and is stirring up even America in his message. He's considered a, a true segula, uh, though crowning Yanuka to replace his father as Grand Master, um, was perfectly logical from the dynastic point of view. Uh, could a boy do the job of, of his father? According to some, he is a prodigy of Torah and a Hasidic master. And of course, we have seen a lot of the, the different uh, Mashiach potentials arrive uh, from the Hasidic uh, dynasties. And obviously, the, late, the latest one was the Lubavitcher Rebbe, that we have, and we've seen over 7,000 to 8,000 of his followers flock every year to 770 to remember their leader. In the summer of 1873, Rabbi Asher Perlov, the master of Karlin Hasidic dynasty, which in today's uh, passed away in nearby Stolen, for 46 rabbis, Asher left behind a, a daughter in the first marriage. And so we, we find this, these, con, these connections of these dynasties well connected all the way back to the idea of uh, Hasidic dynasty. Now, um, 
I'm going to be looking further into the the connection of uh, Yehuda Leib Levin, which happened to be the whole story of the Yanuka and Stolen Hashar, and in which tries to identify the young man as a potential descendant of the dynasty of, of, of this particular dynasty. One thing is for sure, we need not to rush ourselves into proclaiming and indicating any particular one to be the Mashiach. Um, and even the idea of giving him the title of a Yanuka is also somewhat um, difficult and problematic, at least within the Hasidic world, that they see the Yanuka at the head of the table being very, very young, but has an incredible knowledge regarding his Torah. And thus, uh, when Rabbi David died and his grandson, who just became Bar Mitzvah, uh, took on, he began to express an incredible depth of Torah knowledge and Torah wisdom, which till this day, uh, he is an incredible uh, Torah scholar. They even consider him a Gaon. Now, I want us to go for a second back so we could hold back in the rush of declaring anyone Mashiach. There is a process which the Rambam made it very clear that they must go through. And it's very important that we understand that process because without that process, we can find ourselves in a whole bunch of problems, including uh, with this case here with Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda Be'eri. Now, Rambam tells us in the 11th chapter of Hilchot Melachim, uh, which I also translate in Spanish for those of you that would like to see the text in Spanish, have the book uh, available right there on Amazon, the Mishnah Torah, the Laws of Kings um, and Wars. And we read in the 11th chapter, <clears throat> and I'm going to go perhaps the first two paraphrase uh, um, verses, and they hit the main one, which is verse uh, 4 of chapter 11. Because the whole thrust is, in, in fact, regarding the laws of king. One should not presume that the messianic king must work miracles and wonders. This is very important because they're writing now pushing the narrative. This this guy, Yanuka, has, made, has, be, has been able to do miracles, five miracles so far. Okay, that's the narrative that's being pushed as if, like, miracles are required to validate the messianic title, and it's not. The Rambam says it very clearly. One should not presume that the, that the messianic king must work miracles and wonders and bring about new creations within the world, like resurrect the dead or perform other similar deeds. This is definitely not true. And this is why it's so easily to rebuff many of those who are Christians who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, when in fact he said, they base themselves primarily that he did a lot of miracles, he rose the dead, he healed the sick. Those are not the definite requirements for him to be qualified as Messiah. Proof may be brought from the fact that Rabbi Akiba, the great sage of the Mishnah, was one of the supporters of King Bar Kokhba, or King Bar Kosiba, which literally means the son of a liar, and would describe himself, describe him as a Messianic king. He and all the sages of his of his generation considered him to be the messianic king until he was killed because of his sins. Once he was killed, they realized he was not the Messiah. The sages did not ask him for any signs or wonders at all. It's not required signs or wonders. So the main thrust of this matter, according to the Rambam, is the Torah, the law. And his statutes and the laws are everlasting. And we may not add to them or subtract from them. Something that many of the Messianic could have been, should have been, would have been, have done in their history. I'm talking about even not only Bar Kokhba, but also um, um, Shabbatai Zvi, who did the same thing, and others that they add to what was already. They created new innovations to Torah life and Torah ways. You see that also with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, that that took place and how they made uh, as it were, something added to the whole entire Torah. Well, no, but that's Kabbalah. That's a 
they still added to what was already there as a innovation to Torah thought. Now, verse 4, we read, If a king will arise from the house of David, who is learned in Torah, observant of the mitzvot. So if, obviously, if he's a transgressor of the mitzvot of Hashem, he, can no, he, can, he cannot be the Mashiach. If he violates the Torah, we're talking about the written as well as the oral, he cannot be the Mashiach. So as prescribed by the written law and the oral law, as David, his ancestors was, will compel all of Israel to walk in the ways of Torah. In other words, one of his tasks is to encourage Jews, in particular Israel, Israelis, to begin to give back to God. That's a positive thing. Come back to God to live what God has commanded us to live by and to push and compel, even to the point of even forcing them, if he could, to start living the life of Torah observant. As you know, that's the biggest problem that we have in the Jewish community, while over 75% of Jews are not even Torah knowledgeable, even less so observant. This is the big problem that we have here in the U.S., that the majority of our fellow uh, Jews are not observant of Torah, have no knowledge of Torah, and thus when they fall into different positions in politics and so forth, they take that that vacuum of what they don't have in Torah into their political situation. Same thing is true in Israel. This is why now Israel is becoming more religious, is rejecting the leftist positions on many sides, on many issues. This is why Israel is seeing, seeing a real awakening of Torah value in their society, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. But this has upset the, the West here in the United States the current political climate is just contrary. They're more going against Torah value, going against Torah establishments, and thus it's normal to see our uh, the U.S. going against Israeli election, Israeli selection of the right. They detest everything that has to do with the right or God or observance or keeping commandments or, or even pushing the ideals in the philosophies of the religious right in their country, how much more so here. So we read that as prescribed by the written law and the oral law, as David's ancestors was, will compel all. He will influence all. He will push all to walk the way of the Torah and reinforce the breaches in its observance. In other words, correctly interpret or apply how the Torah should be observed. And he will do something else. He will fight the wars of God. Specifically, this is the war of Gog and Magog, which has yet to happen. So he will be involved in politics. He must be involved in the political structure of the land of Israel. And we thus see he will fight these wars of God. These wars of God has to do with the morality with or the lack thereof. He will obviously push for the, 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 the end of these type of protest and march of the freedoms of what today's liberal society considers its, its moral or immoral freedoms. Talking specifically LGBTQ and all the BLM, Emmers, all of that will be fought against them in these wars of God. Why it's wars of God? Because it's a it's it's a behavioral conduct, conduct that's an opposition to God's way of living. We have to say it clearly. One thing is godly way of living, and there's the other way which is not considered godly way of living. And it's very difficult because many of you, many of us, have loved ones that perhaps are involved and all taken up by, by these type of movements. And unfortunately, we need to tell them the truth. We need to explain to them as lovingly as we can, this way is not God's way. This is why I say many times, referring to Psalms 97.10, that God loves those who hate evil. I said this to one rabbi online. He said, oh, God doesn't hate. Yes, he does. Shnui. He hates evil. He even hates when a person practices evil. 
And of course, that covers a lot of ground, obviously. But this is the reason why, in such a gentle way, we see people being attracted to Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda Be'eri, that he does in such a soft way that he's drawing many Israelis to him. In addition to that, he's a person very similar to the heart of David, where he would use music to lift up the souls uh, uh, of the Israelis or the Jews to God. And he has an incredible musical talent. I was listening to it. He has so many talents. It's incredible. It's no wonder, no wonder why many are saying, saying this guy is the Mashiach. No, my friends, he's not. Number one, how do we know? If a king will arise, he's not a king. He may become a leader of the Jewish people, be influenced by his position, because in Jewish mindset, a Rebbe is like, as it were, a, a, a has the power or the influence of a leader. But he's not king. He's not Melech yet. He hasn't been declared Melech Israel. One of the things that we learned that if there is a disconnection of the ascendancy of the, the ancestry of King David through the years as a result of not knowing him, in fact, he's, he's a Davidic descent or not, he has to be pre-qualified pre already. In other words, in order to be able to declare him a potential king, he has to be re-qualified. He had to be declared certifiable as a king of Israel. He hasn't done gone through that process yet. And but he has learned Torah, is observant of the mitzvot, as prescribed both of the written and oral law. So in that sense that he's a learned man, that he he has a photogenic memory of all the Torah that can recite it by memory is an incredible uh first step. But that doesn't make him a Shia. That doesn't make him king either. So one of the things we need to make sure is that he will uh, fight the wars of God. And with insurance, when he does that, <coughs> when he does that, when he's able to certify his, his yichus before all of Israel, and he's able to certify that, in fact, he has an ancestry that goes all the way back to King David and it's certifiable. Then we can say, hmm, possible, both possibly. But he still has to be crowned as a king of Israel. He's a rabbi. He's a he, he has many other rabbis who follow him. And that alone puts some completely aside. Again, that doesn't make him Mashiach. And that doesn't make him Melech. He has to assume both being Melech, king of Israel, which is a political position for all of Israel, if the right takes over, as we're seeing that it will take over, and he is very influential upon all of the leaders of Israel, to the point that they can certify his ancestry and then declare him to be a, a true descendant of King David by proof, not just hearsay, then, then we take him to the next level. But he's not there. He hasn't proven, nor does he show that there is any indication that he is. I hope some of his people will bring those informations up front if, in fact, he has ancestry to Melech, Hada, Melech David. That's the case, then they need to proceed further. But the house of David needs to be confirmed first and, and most of all, that is the first step. But he's not a king. He's not declared Melech. And to be able to declare Melech would be something then then it would fall into the qualification of what the Rambam says. If, if Vaim Yamod Melek Mibet Dovit Mibet David. If he arises from the house of David, he hasn't arisen. It's not clear if he is or not of the house of David. It's not clear if in fact he is of the descendant, paternal descendant of the house of David. I would love to see some information on that, and I'm sure many of you do. But the fact that our enemies are those who who basically have a different Mashiach altogether, are already somewhat uprising because in their mindset, keep in mind, any potential Mashiach for the house of Israel will automatically be declared the anti-Christ or anti-Mashiach of Christian theology. 
And that's a major error. And I'm going to show you why it's a major error in a second because I want you to see the, excuse me, the stupidity of the theological misconception of Antichrist in Christian theology. And I think you need to see this because you need to understand that their warped mind has been completely warped as a result of misinformation or lack of proper uh, instruction from their own Christian Bible. So if you bear with me, let me see if I find somewhere here one of their, their which I've already threw out. One second. Let me see if I find it so you can see it. Since I'm always conversing with people of that faith, and I want you to realize the stupidity, I have to say stupidity, of the lack of insight from their own Christian Bible because they have a mindset that any Jewish religious leader that arises in Israel and that the Jews accept has to be the Antichrist. And I'm going to show you today that's not the case. First of all, we need to understand one main premise from a Christian point of view, not Jewish, Christian point of view, how they look at the words of their followers. First of all, Paul is very problematic because Paul um, goes against, in a lot of ways, what Jesus himself said and what the other apostles say. But let's grant them the leniency to accept what they basically believe. And I'm going to take you to chapter 2 of the Christian Bible for a second. And please, my Jewish friends, Bear with me because I know this is not our Bible, but because we have an audience that is so mixed and anything about Mashiach, their ears percolate, the Christian's ear percolate because they think we're talking about their guy. And in fact, I've, I've said many, many times through this, the Messiah has not yet come. And thus, we and I, and I mean that, I mean, he wasn't the Rebbe of Lubavitch. He wasn't the um, Shabbatai Svi. And he wasn't Jesus. So let's be very clear. My point is clear. He's not a could have been, should have been. In other words, there, there is no potential right now. So I'm covering this in particular to answer both Jews' query regarding this young man who, like I said, he's a brilliant in Torah. I mean, I've listened to him hours an hour, so I, I don't I don't discount the, the the immense knowledge, the immense persuasiveness this young man has, an, an incredible. As a matter of fact, myself and this my friend from Canada, uh, who happens to be a Bedeslov, uh, we, we 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 did a whole video, and this is how I think we, <laughs> we we got the whole Christian world stirred up, thinking this guy is the Mashiach, and the fact is. It was all based on Yeheskiel. And so everybody thought that this guy's name was Yeheskiel. No, his name is not Yeheskiel. It's Yehuda, Shlomo Yehuda Be'iri. And everybody started to say, oh, he's a false messiah. Even the guy from, from Mexico called the Grosso and Paz, Peace, uh, uh, Joy and Peace, which is a Christian ministry, said, oh, this guy's the Antichrist. And you see all through YouTube, all these people posting up, this guy, uh, Yanuka, is the Antichrist for Christians. No, my friends, Christians, listen to me. He's not. <clears throat> and I'm going to explain to you why he cannot be. He cannot be your Antichrist. Any religious Jew who observes Torah observance and observes God's statutes cannot be, will not be, even from your own, uh, follow, your own teacher, Paul, cannot be. The false, your false Mashiach. And I'm going to explain to you why. We're going to go right down to the nitty gritty of why it cannot be. Obviously, in chapter 2 of Thessalonians, which is a Christian Bible, it's the second letter of Paul to the congregation of the Thessalonians, which were they had their Jews and non-Jews mixed together. He writes a letter beseeching you, brethren, Chavarim, about the coming of our master Jesus Christ 
and by the gathering together to him, that you don't be shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Messiah is at hand. Now, interesting enough, the question I have to ask all of you great intellectual theologian, Christian pastors, and evangelists, when did Paul write this letter and sent it out according to you, according to your Christian commentaries? Well, according to the Christian commentaries, it was written in approximately about the year 57 of the Common Era. Let's say 60. Let's push it a little bit further up. Even that there, there's for 60 of the Common Era. Being that the case, keep in mind what takes place in the year 70 of the Common Era. Because it's very, very important on a historical chronological line when things happen that took place that marked the Jewish history. In the year 70, something very much marked the history of the Jews in the land of the Jews in Israel. What was it? It was the destruction of the temple and the abomination that caused the desolation and the dispersion of the Jews to the four corners of the world. Yes, my friends, that's what was spoken of by, the, by Daniel when he made reference about the abomination that caused desolation. Now listen to what he says according to Paul. That you don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or from or by letter as it from us. In other words, there's a lot of uh, counterfeit letters going around. As that day of the Messiah is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, who is the son of perdition? Well, according to Christian theology, Christian eschatology, this is referring to the Antichrist or their Antichrist. Am I not correct on that, my Christian friends? Say yes or no here. I want to hear from you. This is the man of sin. Why are they connected to him, the man of sin, who is to be revealed? He hasn't yet been revealed. He hasn't come to on the scene yet, at least as Paul is writing. For the son of perdition. Now, what are some of the attributes or characteristics of this Antichrist guy that's supposed to be revealed that hasn't been revealed yet? This is very important for you Jews to understand the Christian mindset and for you Christians to understand your misconception even of this. <clears throat> who opposes who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So let's take a, a couple of steps back and think about what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. Will the Antichrist be someone in favor of God? Someone that will be humble. Someone who mm, will follow the laws of God. <clears throat> Is this Antichrist someone that will worship the one God? Will draw people to bring them to the one God? Obviously, according to Paul, no. And this is why Christian theology or eschatology is so warped. Because the Antichrist that they're trying to picture them him into is a guy who's a religious Jew who worships one God, who's not opposed to God, who humbles himself before God, <coughs> who's pious, who teaches Torah, who teaches the very principles of what we all should be observing. This is not an Antichrist figure, my friends. This is a, a godly person who wishes to observe God's law, God's commandment. <coughs> not someone who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. This is an individual that goes contrary to God. He is His ego is bigger than God. He wants to take over the place of God. <coughs> if anything, 
this more looks like the whole structure of the Christian church. That made a man into a God. That made a human being into a God man. This is not, by the way, anything resembling to the Jewish notion of an anti-Messiah or a figure that comes and destroys Torah. This, according to Paul, is what the anti-Messiah is supposed to do. Oppose Torah. Go against Torah. Change the Torah. This is what Paul is referring to. Not this, this, this figure that's a religious Jew that will go into the temple of God and say, well, I'm going to do a switcheroo here. Now that I believe in God, now I'm going to basically go against God. That's not what any Mashiach potential does. <clears throat> this Mashiach, this is why Paul calls him a man of sin who opposes if you're an opponent, it means you're against. Who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, he is the focus of the, temp of the attention. Sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, you know, that when I was with you, I yet told you these things. And now you know what would hold that which may be revealed in this time. It wasn't time yet. What was holding back? God's very moment. When did God's moment take place for all of this to break on the scene? The year 70 of the Common Era. We know by historians, we know by history that Titus Vespasian went into the temple of God, set himself up to be, as it were, be worshipped as God, sacrifice that which is completely um, abomination to the Jews, and even pierced with his sword the curtains, thinking he was going to kill God, opposed God, and began the great persecution of all Israel, all Jewelry, expelling them out of the land, out of our land, and occupied our land, burnt down the temple, destroyed the temple. And this is what Paul was referring to, which yet did not happen during this time that Paul is writing. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he that now hinders will let until he'll be taken out of the way. Who was hindering? Who was blocking the opportunity for this to take place? God. God was holding him back until the moment that was needed for everything to blow up. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the work of the Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice he uses the word unrighteousness, my Christian friends. He's using those words to indicate this is not going to be a Torah observant Jew. It's not going to even be a Jew himself. This is the guy that opposes God, that uses trickery and, and all types of deception to take control and possession. My friends, the very system that destroyed the temple is in place today. Don't have any doubt about it that you guys picked the wrong Antichrist. No wonder you misinterpreted Paul's own word. He's not going to be a, a, a pious Jew, a religious Jew calling on others to come to Torah and to obey God's word. No, he's going to do just the opposite. He's going to be all about unrighteousness, all about letting all types of lawlessness just come out. As a matter of fact, he more resembles like the persons like Biden, like Schwab, these people whose very basis and fundamentals and theology is completely corruption. Let all types of sins be practiced under the name of law and order. This is what Paul was referring to. And that stems out of the revelation, the initial revelation of what took place in the destruction of the temple. My friends, we're still under the Roman kingdom. The kingdom of Rome is still empowering and is the one that's still developing and doing what it's doing into this world. 
until the eternal kingdom comes. Those of you who are following me in my in my studies in Daniel, you will know, at least in Spanish, you will know that the final kingdom is already here. The final government is among the Jewish people. And it's ready and waiting to pop up and bring under like a stone that hits the very foundation of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. This, my friends, is what's so fascinating. You have the information in your literature, but you don't realize the impact that really it's all about. The whole deep state, the whole political scenario that has its full of religious implications, moral as well as ethical, my friends, that's what we're talking about. This is the time where Armelius, according to our, our literature, in Sefer Zerubbabel, comes up and tries to destroy the Jews with implanting a secular, not godly system. So by no means can the Antichrist be Yanuka. Got it? Understand now? Yanuka represents, is, is, he is a, a wellspring of Torah knowledge. He, like many other Jews, are wellsprings of Torah knowledge. These are individuals who are the light of the world. And you're calling it darkness? Do you see the complete stupidity of the argument that they're placing before you? No, even Paul would agree with me. And Paul's not here. But Paul would agree with me that clearly it's not going to be a Jew who's religious in observance to Torah and wants to see the revelation of the true King Messiah, whoever he may be. Notice I, I don't put she may be. I don't fall into that span because clearly it has to be a male figure. Yes, a male figure. Oh, you're, you're, you're discriminating against. Listen, you have to deal with your own um, inability to handle it, to handle the truth. And there's a lot of people out there that can't handle the truth. That's the problem that we have in our society. We don't want to handle the truth. And yet the truth is so before us that never in the world have we seen such clarity, such clear indication that God's going to do something so powerful. He's already doing it. You don't even realize it. All of these secrets that we've seen taking place are right now being revealed right in the forefront. It's being shown behind the scenes. I mean, I was like completely amazed when Elon Musk starts revealing all of this and putting all the stuff that they were doing to the conservatives. I was like, wow, this is incredible. How much more so was going on behind the scenes of what's really taking place with Davos, with the New World Order, with the Economic Forum, and all of these players that really encapsulates really incarnates the idea that Paul, your Christian Paul, is indicating to you that these are men of sin. These are people that are involved in treachery and in treason of all levels and all sorts. My friends, this is what we're talking about. When that wicked one will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the ruach of his pay and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Obviously, we Jews can agree to disagree who that individual is, Christians hold as Jesus in his second coming. We believe it's going to be the Mashiach, that he will destroy all evil, all evil inclination. And here we have something very similar in common. Both Jews and Christians have something similar in common when you understand what Paul was saying. But many of you do not. You have distorted, you have twisted, and you've got to blame the Jews. Why? Because of the inclination of anti-Semitism, of Jewish hate that has been fed through the church. And you need to get yourself out of the church to be able to have more clarity of what he's actually, Paul was even saying. And it says, how will we know Mashiach is Mashiach? Well, Rambam made it very clear with assurance we can consider a person who is delved into Torah knowledge. He reinforces the breaches. He fights the wars of God. We can consider him Mashiach, anointed. We can consider. That's a presumptuous assumption. We can see him as the presumption Mashiach. If he succeeds in the above, 
Now, here comes the added requirements, which so far, none, including Jesus, including Yanuka, including Lubavitcher Rebbe, has not been able to fulfill. If he succeeds and builds the temple in its place, in other words, not places that you think it's the temple, in its place, and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is definitely the Mashiach. He is definitely the Mashiach. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. If he builds the temple, he begins and declares, hey, we're building the temple. Interesting enough, to initiate the temple does not have to be a Jewish person. We see that took place with Cyrus, the king, in the building of the first temple. We realize that a non-Jewish leader declared an order that the building or the rebuilding were to take place to initiate the rebuilding of the temple. Now, I wrote something very interesting to President Trump regarding the same thing, that if he were to become president in 2024, he should initiate a, a, a make an initiative, which I called it the house, rebuilding the house of the Lord. If he, as president, as he's done such a successful job for the Abrahamic Accord, as well as he's done so many good things for Israel, which the Jewish people here haven't given him enough kudos for it, which I recognize the great good he has done. And many Israelis in Israel has done so, such an extent, they love Trump. They don't like Biden at all. At all. Biden represents the forces of this same individual I mentioned in the Christian Bible. He represents the forces of evil, the kingdom of Rome. That's what he represents. He represents the very antithesis to the godly messianic government that will come and be established around the whole entire world. Of course, it's not good news for him. It's not good news for the globalist and the elitist that's trying to depopulate the world. But we do have a word for all of those elitists all of those globalists that are working hard to depopulate the human race. And then when that wicked be revealed, which has been revealed already, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the work, after the doings of Satan with all powers and signs and lying with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. What's the end result to all these individuals? They desire to cause the death and destruction of humanity, and their own death and destruction will come upon them by the very power of God, by the very light of God, by the very hand of God, when godliness and the kingdom of God is revealed here on earth, by the people of God, the Jewish people, the people of Israel. This is an ultimate destiny that God has in store for Kalal Israel, a power and a might so powerful that it will destroy and reveal all of the evil behind the scenes and make it known and will bring to crumble all of these nations that were part of this diabolical plan to destroy humanity. Dr. Zelenko, a blessed memory, was one of those individuals that they kept on blocking everything he said. And a lot of the things he said was 100% accurate scientifically, and they tried to stop him. They tried to threaten him. They tried to even block him out, and they did. To this day, try to put one of Dr. Zelenko's uh, videos online, and you'll see that that such individuals as, as uh, Zuckerberg, and his whole entire conspiracy of working together with our government to hush the mouth, to shut up the voices of the righteous was done by him as he played the part in a, in a, in a, a collusion with the evil government that we have right now administrating this great United States of America. America could only be great as long as as it has a good and positive relationship with Israel. 
but it's a relationship that's hypocritical. It's not a true, honest relationship. And this is why in this nation, we are receiving the very curse from above as a result of actions taken by this administration and policies and laws, because it's based upon wickedness, unrighteousness, sinfulness, and completely in opposition to all that is moral, all that is godly, all that is right. And my Christian friends, get it right. You know, Trump said to the Jews, get it right. Get your acts right. I'm saying to the Christian community, Christians, get your theology corrected and get it right. The Antichrist by no means can be a religious Jew. I hope you understand that. I hope I've shown you that even Paul doesn't see the Antichrist as a godly person, a person who, who follows God's law, who exalts God's name, which is what most religious Jews do, but just contrary to what is understood as godliness. So when you begin to attack people like Yanuka, people like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, people who basically have lifted up the ideology of godliness and Torah in this world, you're picking on the wrong person. You want to pick on someone? Pick on people like the Biden administration. Pick on people like, like Schwab. Pick on people who basically represent the, the clear incarnation of evil in society by rebelling against godliness and godly principles and, and morality. Don't pick on people like DeSantis. Pick on those, on, on those who basically embrace the liberal, immoral basis of society. Yes, my friends, those institutions and organizations, they don't represent God at all. They don't represent morality at all. They don't represent what God has commanded us to do at all. They represent contrary to those notions. And this is why it says in Rambam, if he succeeds in the above, in other words, compelling, assuring, we consider him Mashiach. But the tall tale sign, he's Mashiach, if he builds the temple in his place and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is then definitely the Mashiach. And then he will improve the entire world, motivating all nations to serve God together. There's no problem with a global unity of service to the one God. That's not a negative. That's not an aspect of any type of antichrist system. Just the opposite. It's part and demonstration of a godly messianic idea. I will make, says Zephaniah 3.9, I will make pure people pure speech. It doesn't mean they're all going to be speaking Hebrew. It means that their speech, the way they speak, will be purified, will be made pure, that they will all call upon the name of God and serve him with one purpose. Echad. Shechet. Shechem echad. Le'avodah shechem echad. Which means with one source, with one purpose of unity for God. And those who are for God, they unite with other people who are for God. One of the most powerful messages that we Jews have is that if you unite with other people who love God, who love the idea of commandments and do what God has commanded, that will break away all the powers of evil. He did not succeed to this degree, or if he was killed, I'm talking about the Messiah, he is surely not the Redeemer promised by the Torah. So two things, obviously. Death disqualifies. Being killed disqualifies. Rather, he should be considered as all the other proper, complete kings of the Davidic dynasty who died. Notice this. If he was killed or he died, no, he's not the Messiah. But you know what? He should be considered as one of the could have been, should have been, would have been. He died in his order to test all Israel to see if we really loved God or we were following after a man. And it states that some of the wise men will stumble and try them to refine them and clarify until the appointed time because the set time is in the future. <clears throat> now, this is the Rambam speaking about the 14th, 15th century, referring to the future that he still has not seen. We have still not seen the Mashiach. But when the Mashiach comes, we will all know. And all those who died and failed are part of our past failed Messiah. Shalom, shalom. And I hope you share this video with everyone 
that believes in the coming of Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah. So it's very clear that the Mashiach, according to Jewish ideology, is not an Antichrist comparison at all. So stop pointing your finger saying such a religious Jew is the Antichrist or such a person like this one is an Antichrist. Because we can't say that the same about your Messiah. Because after all, you're worshiping a man. Jews will not worship a man as God. And this has got to be very clearly stated. Anytime you see a worship of man to the level of divinity, we then have a problem to have to reject that person altogether. We respect, we honor, we give them honor. This idea of kissing of the hands is an old tradition of showing respect and love to that which you love. And the pious people are loved. It was an ancient custom to kiss. You'll see this in, as a cultural setting. People who love, they kiss the hands of their, of their dear teacher as if it were father. So do not get the wrong mindset that they're worshiping the man. They're giving him respect and honor. For he carries the words of God. And that which is dear to us, we kiss. That's why we kiss the mezuzah. That's why we kiss the Torah. We kiss what we love. We love God. He has no body. So this is our way of expressing our endearment to God. Thank you.